In the previous video, we were able to squeeze 77.5 miles to the gallon out of the 719cc turbo diesel Saturn, and most would agree that's pretty good. Now, keep in mind the driveline on this car is completely custom made, and what we discovered was the custom exhaust system was too restricted for this turbo diesel engine, and we were able to improve on the fuel economy by merely disconnecting the exhaust about a foot and a half from the turbocharger. While 77.5 miles to the gallon is outstanding, we wondered if it would be possible to squeeze a little more from this car. Now, according to some of our viewers, the short exhaust pipe that connects the turbo to the rest of the exhaust is too restrictive. And well, that may be true. So today, let's do an experiment and find out if increasing the diameter of the downpipe will improve the fuel economy on our project car. So give me a minute and I'll remove the downpipe so we can take a better look. Here we go. Not much to look at, but like I said before, this pipe connects the turbo to the rest of the exhaust system. And with this pipe disconnected from the rest of the exhaust, well, we were able to improve the fuel economy from 73 miles to the gallon to 77 miles to the gallon. Now this pipe is an inch and a half in diameter, and while that may seem small, keep in mind this engine's only 719 cc's, so it may or may not be the right size. However, if we follow the trend seen on most turbo diesel trucks, bigger is better. So let's replace this pipe with something bigger and perhaps a little shorter. So over here we have a new turbo flange and some parts to build a new 2 inch downpipe. Now the RHB31 turbo that we're using ain't big, so we can't connect a 2 inch downpipe directly to the flange. So we'll have to use this adapter to mate the downpipe to the flange. Unfortunately, the opening on this flange is slightly smaller than our adapter, so we'll need to bore it out on a lathe. Now when I say this downpipe, well, I really mean uppipe, because in order to make this pipe as short as possible, it's going to need to exit the car through a hole in the hood. I reckon that'll work out just fine. Opening this hole up by using a lathe ain't easy and it has to be done from two directions. We've already opened it up on the other side, and now we need to finish boring through this flange from this side. Let's see how close we are. Hmm, almost. Just a wee bit more and that should do it. Yeah, this fits, but I would like a slightly looser fit. And that should do it. So we're ready to weld the pipe to the flange, and as you can see, we machined a slight undercut to allow room for the weld bead. Of course, we'll have to trim off the excess weld beads when we're done, but that won't be a problem. Now, the only real issue is, my welder may not have enough power to penetrate this flange effectively. So on stuff like this, I like to preheat the metal before welding, and for that, we'll use this map torch. So fast forward a bit and we have the torch licking the flange with fire. And this is one of those deals where you just set the torch up and walk away for about five minutes and let the heat penetrate the steel. It's not perfect, but it works. And now we can weld. So this is a bit messy, but I do believe we have ample penetration. And all we need to do now is run this part over the belt sander to smooth out the weld bead. And that's good enough. We can finish off the rest with a hand file. Well, that didn't take long, and it's starting to resemble the part that we need. And now a few more tack welds to hold the pipe in place. Now we're only tack welding this together because it only has to work long enough for today's experiment. Well, there it is, the up pipes mounted to the turbo. And it looks, well, it looks all right. Certainly good enough for the Saturn. Anyway, the up pipe is stainless steel, and the rest of the regular steel parts were coated with VHT high temperature paint. This VHT paint seems to hold up surprisingly well to the exhaust temperatures. Now all we need to do is put a hole in a hood and we're done. How hard could that be? Well, it turns out the hole we need to cut interferes with the hood braces, which ain't really a problem because we don't need no stinking hood braces, so let's cut them off. Well, that was easy, and we were careful not to cut through the surface of the hood, which takes great skill or luck. And I'm not really sure it matters, because if you haven't noticed by now, this is pretty much a hack job. Now we need to drill a hole right here. Now we can scrape some of this glue off that may get in the way. All right, well, to cut the hole in the hood, we're gonna try this circle cutter. Now this may not work the way we expect, so we do have a plan B in case you're wondering. Well, it may work, but I think it's time for plan B. 
And plan B is now activated. So that wasn't too hard, and more incredibly, we didn't harm any of the paint on the hood. Well, sort of. And there we go. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Let's see how it works. Yup, that was kind of what I was expecting. Let's take the car out for a spin and see if I'm still able to breathe while driving the car, which is kind of important. Meh, the fumes aren't that bad. Now you probably noticed, but the car was rolling a little bit of coal on acceleration, which is to be expected from a diesel engine. But I think for this test, we're going to dial back on the fuel a little bit. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, well, you're probably familiar with the fuel rack adjustment that we've been doing. And the last time we set it was at 31.31 millimeter for the maximum fuel for maximum speed. Today we're going to set the rack screw to 33.5 millimeter, and that'll still give us plenty of power, but we'll cut down on some of the smoke during acceleration. So before we head out, the fuel tank's been topped off, and this time around we're going to measure the temperature of the fuel before and after the test. The purpose of this is to ensure that the fuel's at the same temperature when we refuel the car after the test. And if it's not at the same temperature, we'll wait until it is before we refuel the car. This will account for any minor expansion of the fuel that may affect our results. Oh yeah, this time around we want the engine to run between 180 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit, so in order to do that we blocked off the air going to the radiator. And this slight gap here is probably all we need to keep the engine cool, and if not, we can turn the heater on if the car should overheat. Alright, we're off on our epic journey to find out if this exhaust modification is the right direction we need to be going. Now obviously the exhaust stack going through the hood is a bit of an overkill, but keep in mind we're testing the effects of less back pressure and this is the simplest and cheapest way to determine what works. Now if we see an improvement, then of course that means the exhaust system on this car needs to be significantly larger. Now in the previous episode, we experimented with a modified overdrive, and what we did was swap in a more extreme overdrive gear set to lower the engine RPM at cruising speed. Well, the experiment showed us that this little engine didn't have enough power to maintain a steady cruising speed, and we ended up consuming more fuel with the modified overdrive. So off camera, we converted the transmission back, and now it has the standard overdrive that we've been using since day one. Now the overdrive modification was simple because we were able to swap the taller 5th gear set from a Saturn MP2 transmission into the 5th gear slot on our Saturn MP3 transmission without completely dismantling the transmission. Some folks pointed out that the gear ratio used for 4th gear on the MP2 transmission would have been more ideal, and yep, I agree. However, it's not possible to transfer the gear set used for 4th on one transmission to the 5th gear position on another transmission. A gear swap like that would require expensive machining, if it were even possible at all. So on this road test, we have the camera pointed at the Madman EMS-3 engine monitoring system right here, and of course I'm doing this test completely blind because I can't see the data you folks are privy to. Keep an eye on the engine coolant temperature as it continues to rise. Well, I say this because the engine is about to trigger the overheat alarm due to the tape we used to block the airflow to the radiator. And here we go. So all I had to do was switch the cabin heater on, and that'll suck the extra heat from the cooling system. Now what's cool about the alarm feature is, even though I can't see the data, the programmable alarm notified me of the impending disaster in plenty of time, and the situation was resolved. Now what's even cooler is, the MS-3 has the capacity to switch on the radiator cooling fan in an event like this, but unfortunately this car doesn't have a fan on the radiator because we were too lazy to install one. Meh, technology is awesome. All right, well, let's head back to the studio and find out how much fuel we consumed. Before we could top off the tank, we had to wait a short while for the temperature of the fuel in the tank to drop from 82 degrees Fahrenheit down to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure how much of a difference this makes, but we're doing it at the suggestion of some of the viewers. So now we can top off the fuel tank. 
And for the troublemakers in the comment section, regular diesel fuel looks like this and off-road diesel fuels dyed red. We are clearly using regular diesel fuel, okay? Now for this test, we only traveled 54.9 miles and that was mainly due to the fumes inside the car were becoming overwhelming. And yes, the windows were down, which upset some people. Meh, it is what it is. So it looks like we consumed exactly 2.6 liters of fuel during our test and that works out to an incredible 80.02 miles to the gallon. I reckon that's pretty good and it's possible the car could have done a little bit better, but I'm happy with these results. Now off camera we went back out and ran the exact same route again, but this time we did it with the car in fourth gear the whole time. And yeah, the engine spun a little bit faster, but we wanted to see if the overdrive was helping or hurting the fuel economy. And believe it or not, this is not a stupid question. You see, you can't just assume what works on a factory built and engineered car will also work on a car that was slapped together with an engine from a refrigerated semi-truck trailer and a whole lot of chewing gum. Anyway, with the car in fourth gear for the cruising portion of the entire journey, we got 78.8 miles to the gallon, which ain't as good as 80, but it's not far behind. I personally think that's interesting. So if you recall, before we started out our epic fuel economy run, we modified the position of the fuel rack limiter screw. Now, since the screw limits the amount of fuel the engine receives at full throttle, it really shouldn't have affected our test much because we never even came close to running the engine at full throttle. Now, the reason we adjusted the screw was to cut down on the puffs of smoke we were getting when shifting through the gears. You see, the accelerator pedal on this car isn't connected directly to the throttle. Instead, the accelerator has to pass through the governor, and the governor is what controls the throttle. And since we have the governor maxed out, well, the governor will slam the fuel rack to its limit momentarily on each gear change. I doubt it had any effect on the fuel economy, because like I mentioned a moment ago, we didn't even come close to using full throttle on this test. So the adjustment really didn't have any effect on performance due to the way we were driving. I hope that makes sense. Meh. It makes sense to me because I've spent a lot of time tuning this engine and driving this car and you really have to sit in a driver's seat to fully understand how this car works. As a matter of fact, I think anybody who has operated farm equipment would have a better understanding than your average driver would. Anyway, with the fuel rack dialed back, let's see how the car performs in the 0-60 to 60 test. <laughs> this should be fun. So the time to beat is 26.73 seconds for the 0-60. to 60. Now with the fuel rack adjusted the way it is, well, we ain't going to be making a lot of power, and the way the fuel system works with the turbo, we're also going to have less powerful exhaust pulses pumping through the turbo, and that will result in less boost. I think a lot of you folks noticed that this engine only makes boost when it's under a load, and that's concerning because I believe the RHB31 turbo is the smallest turbo that's commonly available, and while it makes plenty of boost, it'll only do so when the engine is chooching at full steam with ample fuel. Oh yeah. Even though we backed off on the fuel, it'll roll coal to a certain extent, and that's more or less the nature of a diesel engine. My bad, I forgot to turn the heater on to keep the engine cool. Let me turn down the volume. Wow, the turbo ain't making any serious boost. You know the wastegate is set for 15 PSI and in the past we had no problem getting there. Hmm. Well, the good news is it got to 60. The bad news is it took almost twice as long to get there. Poor car. Well, this Saturn has provided us with tons of invaluable data, and we've more or less tortured this car from the beginning. I think at this point, it's appeared in over 23 episodes, and I reckon we could continue the diesel engine experiments for a few more months, but I think it's time to move on. Don't worry, the diesel engine will be back, but in a different car. I think the second round of diesel mania will be epic. Anyway, for now, I'm sick and tired of smelling like diesel fuel, and I think it's time to focus on the 670cc V-twin Predator-powered Renault 10. Can we get this old Renault to 60 miles per hour in less than 26.73 seconds? Well, I reckon we can, but it ain't going to be easy. Until next time.